So just like last time, it just didn't record correctly. I don't know what I'm doing wrong in there. So I will do this instead. So the plant diversity, it's just a lot of talking. I'm sorry. We talked about a potential extra credit for you. And the point is to give it to one of your former teachers um, just because they usually don't get thanks. So today, what we're looking at, we're not meeting in lab next week. I'll post a video. I'll record a little something as an overview of what we're going to be doing. But we're going to be meeting at Irvine Park on May 19th. That's Sunday at 1 o'clock. I'll bring some snacks. Um, we're going to meet in parking lot 7, which is just to the right of when you come on in. The quiz is going to be online. And you just have to take next week's quiz during class time. So as long as you take it within those, you know, three hours, you'll be fine. The point of this lab is to look at plants. There are four characteristics of plants. Not all plants will have all four, but we'll see. Plants have cell walls, and they're going to be made out of a carbohydrate called cellulose. When they store energy, they store it as starch, kind of like how we store our energy as fat. If you have a photosynthetic plant, they will use chlorophyll B as a pigment. If you look at things like algae, they don't necessarily use chlorophyll B. Same thing with green uh, or blue-green algae. If they have seeds, they actually have structures that are going to help support the embryo in its growing. A lot of these things here allow plants to meet two challenges because most plants are going to be terrestrial. That is to say they're on land. They need to prevent dehydration when they're on land and they need to reproduce when they're not in water. Some can reproduce with or need to reproduce with water. So they need to have really wet soil, but most don't. When we look at diversity, it helps if we have a review of like or stick into our heads how taxonomy works. So taxonomy is how you classify organisms, but then we have a new branch of science, new, it's been around for a couple of decades, called systematics, and that's going to use evolutionary information like DNA sequences and protein sequences to put organisms into an evolutionary sets of categories. So a scheme was developed by a guy named Carl Linnaeus for taxonomy, which is how do you categorize or put life into these boxes? What he came up with was kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. We have since added in domain. Domain is going to be the most broad, meaning it will be the most encompassing. So there aren't as many defining characteristics. But when you get down to species, it's going to be the most nitpicky, and there'll be the most set of specific requirements to say you are fill in the blank. How could you remember this order? I don't know. You can come up with whatever little limerick you want, but Dole King Paul came over for great spaghetti or something like that, whatever. But if you look at it, Dole King Paul came over for great spaghetti. Hooray. We also can have subdivisions and things like that. One of the things that is difficult in biology right now is we're trying to take our old taxonomy and apply it to or use systematics to apply up here. And it's causing some trouble in terms of how we would classify organisms. So one of the things that you're going to notice is I'm going to point out some words up here. And then when you looked around at the various displays, they didn't match up at all. And that's because sometimes they don't, we've changed our minds. We've, so old information is gone. You're going to definitely notice this with the animal lab, where I'm actually going to just flat out say, this is not right in the lab manual. And I'm going to show you what the correct answers are. When we look at plants, the easiest way to figure out the taxonomy, which actually turns out to follow the systematics, is to ask a series of questions. So if I look at the kingdom of plants, what I can ask is, is this plant vascular or not? Meaning, does it have tissues that allow it to move water? If the answer is no, 
It's a non-vascular plant. If the answer is yes, it's a vascular plant. If I ask, does this plant that's vascular make seeds? The answer will either be no, so we call these the seedless plants, or the answer will be yes. They're the seed-making plants. If I ask, do these seed-making plants form flowers or not? The answer will either be no, we call those the gymnosperms, or the answer will be yes, we call those the angiosperms. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to walk through here, 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 and then here. And then we'll look at some plant anatomy. So when we look at the non-vascular plants, they're relatively simple, and they use just osmosis to shove water on through. They don't have vascular tissue. In plants, the vascular tissues are called xylem, which moves water, and phloem, which moves metabolites. You, when you think of, like, sap or, like, syrups and stuff like that, those are the metabolites. Collectively, we can refer to non-vascular plants as bryophytes, where I still didn't look up what bryo means, but I'm sure it means something like mossy. But phyte, whenever you see P-H-Y-T-E, that means plant. So if I look at the bryophytes, those include things like mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. Mosses you've seen, hornworts, and liverworts you probably haven't seen but they'll be on display. When we look at their phyla, so I don't expect you to remember these phyla names. So phyla is plural for many, phy so phylum is one, more than one is phyla. I'm not gonna expect that you remember this and if they show up on the lab exam, I will change those questions. But we have bryophyta, we have anthocerophyta, then we have Hepatic nah, why can't I not talk? Hepatic hepaticophyta. There we go. Because you have to get the, the flow of the word right. So if you're curious, these are the mosses. These here turn out to be the hornworts. And then these ones here turn out to be the liverworts. Hepato means liver. The anthoceros references horns. Hooray. And then there's some displays. The vascular seedless plants, these will have xylem and phloem. They're famous for the ferns and the horsetails. They actually produce spores, not seeds, so you could actually look and find where they make spores. The spores are going to be easiest to found or to found to find in ferns. They've gone through many reclassifications. So if you start looking at the display, they're actually gonna give you different information than what your lab manual says, which is always lovely. So the horsetails, whisk ferns, and the ferns are all in monolithophyta. And then the club mosses are like a putophyta. And again, we don't need to remember these words. I, I'm, I will not have you remember them for the lab exam. And then we have some displays. When we look at gymnosperms, gymnos means naked. So sperm is seed, so these are the naked seeds, and they're all wind-pollinated. There are four major phyla, and again, I'm not gonna expect that you would remember these four names. We have the ginkgos, so ginkophyta. We have the netophytes, or the netophyta. The cycads, cycophyta. And then we have the conifers, conerophyta. Um, these are the only ones that you've probably seen. So these are like the pine trees and fir trees and stuff like that. Cycads look like really small palm trees. The netophytes are really weird looking. And ginkgos, if you know what they are, you can instantly identify them. But if not, you, you probably don't notice. You'd walk right past them. They have leaves that kind of look like seashells. All these are cone producers. And they do make a fruit, but the fruit is not like what we think of as fruit. And they also all produce seeds, but the seeds are relatively small and, quote, naked, unquote. So you have some displays and you're asked to look at some slides of gymnosperm pollen. The angiosperms are the ones that produce flowers. They have a very strange way of reproducing, something referred to as double fertilization. And part of one of their structures, the ovary, is ultimately going to become a fruit. 
If it does that, it's a real fruit, and if it's something other than the ovary, then we call it an accessory fruit, and there's all sorts of words. In the back, there's some options for you to look at between fruits and vegetables. There's two huge lineages of angiosperms. There's actually more, but there's two really big ones. These two words I'm okay with you knowing because they're actually useful. The eudicots, these are going to be most flowers that you think of. So when you think of a eudicot, like this one right here turns out to be a eudicot. So there's all these characteristics to describe them. So they have branched veins. So if you look at the leaves, the leaves don't have lines that are all parallel. If I look at the petals, I have one, two, three, four, five. So if you have bundles of four or five or multiples of four or multiples of five, those would be dicots. The eudicot part references the cotyledons, which are embryonic leaves, and we'll look at that later. The monocots have parallel veins. Think of grass, and they have a weird type of root. Their petals are, are, are always in clusters of threes, and they also only have one embryonic leaf, which is why they're called a monocotyledon, as opposed to a di or two cotyledon. And then there's some displays to look at. There's a lot of anatomy when it comes to plants, and I know it's a lot, but it's what it is. When we look at plants, we can basically divide everything up into roots, the shoots, and the leaves. If you're looking at a flowering plant, we can then look at flowers and seeds as well. So what we're now going to do is walk through roots, shoots, leaves, flowers, and seeds. Looking at seeds, once a seed germinates, it's going to have five structures that you can immediately identify. This here turns out to be a dicot or a eudicot. So in terms of pointing out where all these turn out to be, this portion right here, these actually turn out to be the embryonic leaves. So these would be the cotyledons. There's actually two of them here. So this is a eudicot. This portion up here is above the cotyledons. So we call this above or epi. So this area is what we would call the epicotyl, which is this word. So the area below the cotyledons, below is hypo. So we would call that the hypocotyl. So we have cotyledon, epicotyl, hypocotyl. Here it turns out to be the remainder of the seed, which is the seed coat. And the radical is the embryonic root, which is right here. And then you're asked to look at some slides. When we look at roots, they're going to do a few things. They're going to anchor the plant into the soil. They're going to help absorb water and nutrients, namely ions. And they're also going to be a storage vessel. So it's where we can, where the plant can store its starch. They come in two major types, what we call a taproot or a fibrous root. Tap roots like look like a wedge shoved into the ground. Fibrous roots are actually all tangled all over the place. Fibrous roots are harder to pull out, so they're better at anchoring into the soil. Tap roots are better for food storage. And there's all sorts of other weird types like buttress roots and nematophores, and then you have aerial roots, and then you have vining roots, and there's all sorts of stuff there. When we look at how roots grow, they actually all have a similar structure, kind of like this. This is actually an allium root tip, which is an onion. They're going to have this cap area. This is actually where the onion, the root, is going to shove its way through the soil or through concrete or whatever else. We're going to have an area of where the cells are going to divide, so a division area. That involves what we call meristematic tissue. So meristematic tissue is this area of division. We have an area where the cells stretch out, so that's going to be an elongation. We're also going to have an area where the cells are going to become different types of cells. We call that differentiation or a maturation. Then you have some models to look at. You also have some roots to look at under the microscope. So this is a cross section, which is where you slice it along, you know, side to side. So in terms of parts, this outer section is what we would call the epidermis. So the outer skin. If you look, you can see this inner ring. So that inner ring would be the outside of it is the endodermis, which is what I just said here. All of the stuff in between 
We call that the cortex. What we now have is if we look here, we're going to find the xylem and the phloem. Typically, you'll actually have the xylem. Xylem in this case is going to be on the outside. And then the phloem is going to be in the middle. But, you know, with it being far away, you actually have to somewhat zoom in to get a better view of it. Typically, you'll have xylem and then you have phloem in the center. Phloem is alive and xylem turns out to be dead. It, so the plant actually will intentionally kill off these tissues for them to work. And they actually do need to be dead, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do their jobs. If I look at stems, they have a few functions, like transporting water and food. They're a place where the leaves can hold on. Sometimes we can store in stems. Like if you think of um, a tuber, which would be ginger or um, a potato, those would be storage stems. So those would be vegetables that you would eat. There's lots of patterns within these stems, and it, and it depends if it's a monocot or a dicot. We could also get maturation inside of these stems, which produces mature wood. Mature wood is lignified, meaning it has this compound called lignin within it. Lignin is a good, um, it's really waxy, and it's really good for us if you wish to make fire. So lignified wood is really good for long burning fires. It also strengthens the wood. As it grows, you get these rings that turn out to form in the dicots. And it's a way of measuring how long it's been growing side to side. So we can look at some displays of that. But looking at these rings that form side to side, it's referred to as dendrochronology. So dendro is branch, chronology is time. So we're using branches to tell us about time or these tree rings. The way it turns out to work is one tree ring equals a growing season. So if you count 20 rings, you have 20 years of growing. Seems easy enough. There are patterns as to what those rings look like. And you could actually see if you do some chemistry, you could analyze what's inside of each of the rings. And you could start to match these up around the world. And if one of them is something that you can age, you could actually now age wood and actually say when this piece of wood was probably germinated and when it was chopped down. And we've actually done this before using um, Viking wood that we could actually figure out about when um, some Viking structures were built in North America. When we look at the leaves, there are similar patterns. We're only going to look at a dicot leaf. So we'll have up here, this will be the epidermis. This part here that we see is what we would actually refer to as the middle of the leaf. So the way that we say middle of the leaf is meso, middle, and phyll, P-H-Y-L-L, -L, means leaf. So this is the leaf middle. There are two portions of it. We have this top section that we would call the palisade, where they're all kind of parallel in a row. And then we have this area down here that's kind of all broken up, kind of like a sponge. We call that the spongy mesophyll. This little circle thing here would be the vascular bundle. And then this portion here is what we would call stomata. One is called a stoma. Two of them make stomata. So you're going to be asked to observe this. And you're also going to be asked to make a slide of stomata, which I did for you. When we look at flowers, they also have patterns to it. There's what's known as a complete or a perfect flower, and that's where you have all four parts. If you don't have one of these, it's an incomplete flower. First part would be what we call the sepals, which are going to be these little leaves at the base of the flower. We have the petals here. So we can only see three, so probably there are two that were taken away. We have the stamen, which is this structure here. So the stamen is composed of the anther, which is the top little peanut looking thing, and the filament, which is the stalk. This is where the pollen is made. The middle section is called a pistil. Well, this would be a pistil composed of one carpal, that terminology we don't need to get into. 
it's broken into three regions. The top is the stigma, the stalk is the style, and the base is the ovary. This is where the eggs are kept. Pollen lands on the top and they grow on in, and then they'll fertilize the eggs, and voila. This will ultimately become the fruit. Sometimes you can have it where there's gonna be lots of these flowers all in a row. So you're gonna get lots of fruits that will be all clustered together. So an aggregate fruit. Um, some fruits are really small and simple. So those would be things like peas. And then you could have fruits where some of these parts remain attached. And that would be things like apples. And those are what we would call accessory fruits. Then you have some stuff to observe. So for your lab, there's lots of displays to look at. We have some microscope slides. You have an activity involving making this, making the um, stomata slide, and you also are going to look at dendrochronology. It's just putting everything away. Those are the slides or the pages with questions. Next week, online again, online, so it's going to be lots of multiple choice. You're going to be asked about plant taxonomy, microscope slides, leaf root review, and then a review question. Expect there to be pictures, so be ready to answer questions about pictures. Again, the quiz is going to be online only. We're going to meet on Sunday, May 19th at 1 o'clock, parking lot 7. Don't show up to class. And since I forgot to bring paper, we didn't do the exit ticket.